Hi everyone, thanks so much um, for joining us tonight. As you can see, China is recording and um, appreciate those of you on different um, East Coast and um, different parts of the country. Um, I'm wondering, China, can you share your screen with my PowerPoint or no? Um, let me try. Let me start. I think I just sent you the PDF. Don't yeah. worry, people. We've been we've survived the pandemic. We are very good with online and Zoom. As you can see, we um, we're so comfortable with it. We have to try different strategies on different days. Um, just while China's even looking to see whether she can locate that. Okay. Um, oh yeah, thanks. That's great. That's perfect. Um, so one of the things I did want to say is you may know this already, but our program, our PhD program. Um, is um, what they call a hybrid program is predominantly online. Um, and we do have research um, intensives. So we come onto campus once per semester for about a week. And um, during the pandemic, we did everything virtually, but fall will be our first return back to campus. Yay, I'm so excited. We love hanging out with people in person. Um, so we have been doing hybrid and online um, for quite a number of years, at least the 13 years or more that I've been here in um, Colorado, uh, which meant during the pandemic, we didn't have to pivot very much. Lots of people learned from our experiences. Um, with it being online, the majority of the time it's online, um, you'll have some synchronous sessions, um, but other, otherwise it's asynchronous. So um, we've been using this platform, we've been using this hybrid approach very, very successfully for a number of years. Um, and a lot of our applicants, a lot of our students who come to our program really appreciate the flexibility. Many of you guys often have um, full-time careers, <laughs> leadership positions, full-time families and something else and something else. So um, we find that this format works really, really well um, and we're not new to the party in terms of online. So um, obviously today is about the PhD program. It is a research doctorate. Um, thank you, China. And I'm not sure if she can flick up. I don't think I can do anything. Thank you. Um, so one of the challenges we have um, at doctoral education um, for nursing is that, and other disciplines actually with our caring science, um, is picking which particular doctoral pathway is the right way. So we have, um, unlike other disciplines, we have a professional doctorate, um, which is our doctor of nursing practice. Uh, but we also have the PhD and the PhD really is um, the premier research um, uh, doctorate for us. And we consider it to be our terminal degree, even though there's a DMP and a PhD. So um, this slide there that says there's two ways of spreading light. You can either be the candle or the mirror that reflects it. And, you know, this is a great analogy um, for what's the difference between a PhD and a DMP. So a PhD um, develops new knowledge. I'm not suggesting that DMPs don't have new implementation knowledge or translational knowledge, um, but certainly PhD is more about knowledge construction, new knowledge, and then our DMP colleagues um, take that knowledge and implement it relevant to particular practice settings and populations. Um, so here you go, you will need a terminal degree. If you're interested in um, research and research funding, um, certainly in the United States at this point in time, um, a PhD is what they're looking for. Um, you'll find that MDs will apply for research funding, but they often have to have fellowships, career development awards and other things. So within nursing, as you can see, the DMP um, is clinically based. Um, you can have opportunities in nursing education as you can with a PhD. Um, as, you, as you see, evaluation based um, problem based, not necessarily generalizable in our more traditional sense, but of course, as implementation science grows in this country, then the skills and techniques, there is some overlap for PhD and DMP, but DMP is much more um, local context and specific um, and very much application of new knowledge and putting it into um, context. Our PhD, on the other hand, is research based in the sense of gener generating um, new knowledge um, 
mostly generalizable because if we get into discussions about methodologies, I could offer you an alternative position. But in terms of national conversations and differentiating between the two, a PhD is research based, is generalizable beyond the local context where you do the work, um, and it is to create new knowledge in different forms uh, moving forward. Now, I think we're quite, um, thank you, China. I think we're quite unique at our college because for the last two years, I think it's been, um, we have been actually studying this overlap between what's a PhD and what's a DMP. So one of our faculty, Dr. Peggy Jenkins, um, along with other faculty have really been working with our PhD students and our DMP students to work out and test some of the boundaries of what those differences are, but in alignment with national conversations. So um, the essentials, if any of you are involved in this in education, will know that the essentials are coming out or have come out in their new informing education for nursing, um, but also the role that research plays starts very, very early on. Um, and some of those um, threads and that new knowledge around how what, why research is important and how we pull that together. Um, there is some um, common ground between the two, but there are also some role differences. And certainly we want to work to build and accelerate research into practice um, beyond the extensive time currently. Um, so we are doing partnerships with our DMP students as well as our PhD students do not only PhD work, but to do some collaborative work as well. So that's very cutting edge here in the United States. Um, so watch this space for that. But currently, our PhD program is our PhD program. Um, we don't have a pipeline with the DMP right now. Um, so one of the things you need to think about is, um, you know, what kind of questions keep popping into your head? Um, you know, what do you want to study and why? Why are you passionate about something? Um, and to find answers, not just in the library, you want to create new knowledge. So um, let me just ask the group, um, why do you want to do a PhD? Maybe you could just randomly uh, shout out, why do you want to do a PhD? You'll find being very Australian, I'm all about, I will put my Hollywood squares up and I'll start asking questions. So feel free to chat with us. Um, what sort of things have gone through your head? Why do you want to do a PhD? Anyone? Is there anyone out there? Okay, I'll go since no one else is. Yay. I know you're all. I know you're all thinking something, but um, <laughs> and just long story short, I have a DMP, and I yeah. um, have been working on some DMP level things for some years, and it's been great. And I realized the more I did it, the more that I wanted to the more I was using research and the more I had questions about research gaps and the more I thought, oh, wouldn't it be great to study that? And right. I certainly have some skills to do that, um, but I would like to acquire more. So that's me. Well, Julie, thank you for jumping in there. Thank you for sharing that. We certainly have had a couple of people um, who did DMP, who started to work in research teams and found that they, they wanted to uh, move to a PhD as well. I'm hoping in the future to develop a dual degree, but it won't be any time in the next couple of years. And certainly I will look at shortening the pipeline. Um, certainly, you know, we can give up to about nine credits currently if you've got a DAP against electives. Um, but let's just say I'm working on that very much um, in terms of DMP translating over to a PhD. So thanks for sharing that. Anyone else, why do you want to do a PhD? I was going to say, I think because Rachel's strong arming me and making me do it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, do you, mean, you mean Dr. Rachel Johnson? Yeah. Yes, yeah. Against, against your will. I'm sure, Emily. That's right. great. <laughs> no, but the real answer is that I have a, I have a degree um, in theology and philosophy and a different permutation of my nice. career. And so just coming into this venue where there is space to theorize and like you're saying, Jackie, create knowledge and, and um, yeah, be able to explore these things in a way that um, for me, direct practice just isn't offering. And Emily, am I wrong that you're a licensed clinical social worker? I am. Yes. Yeah. So I was just I'm, checking. I was just checking. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah um, so we're delighted to have you exploring this. 
And um, unlike, uh, somewhat like Rachel strong arming you, I'm sure at some point Dr. Johnson will share that she was also strong armed by a number of her colleagues and strongly encouraged and lovingly facilitated and supported. Best in decision that. ever. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. No worries. Well, thank you, Emily, for sharing that. Who else wants to just give us maybe two more people? Why do you want to do a PhD? Well, I'm going to be the first to admit that, that I'm um, I'm just basically a nerd. And Who's that? Who's that? I can't see you. I can't see you. Who's that? Oh, this is Laura. Oh, hi, Laura. Welcome, nerd. I'm I'm a nerd too. <laughs> and um, that I um, that the more I know, the more I want to know, and um, I just enjoy being a student and enjoy sort of furthering the field. I do love nursing quite a bit. Um, I have never regretted not going to medical school. And I find that being a nurse practitioner and getting deeper and deeper into the nursing field has been the most one of the most gratifying paths that I've chosen. My particular area in nursing is mental health. And um, I, I put in particularly um, fell in love with nursing even deeper when I found the theory of caring. And, um, Great. and the fact that the theory of caring is is such an uh, amazing research uh, model um, at, and bringing also um, a philosophical model has been an inspiration to me as a practicing person um, and, and brings together sort of that spiritual, um, artistic, esoteric part of me and, and the very sciencey part of me together, um, which to me is, is nursing. <laughs> that's well, the way I practice nursing and I practice mental health. So. Well, Laura, that's great. And um, I'm just going to run through a couple of um, slides that I have here to keep me on track because I can chat and be enthusiastic about our program. But I do want to make sure I hit a few high points. And then when I've done that, I'll be handing it over to Rachel, who, um, you know, Dr. Johnson will be able to share some of the nuances about what our program in Caring Science is about. Um, just so you know, I'm a care test coach. My PhD um, was also being caring as an emergency nurse, not Dr. Watson's work, but um, I have affinity. So thank you. Why our program? So um, many people, we do say location, location, location. You know, um, I believe we have a fantastic campus. I think Colorado is an incredibly uh, innovative um, multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary kind of space at Anschutz Medical Campus. But of course, our PhD program is housed, um, is awarded from the graduate school. But obviously, it's our College of Nursing PhD program. And of course, because it's hybrid, um, you spend most of your time online or at a distance. Um, some of you may be local, um, but that's where our um, intensives come in. We really work very hard on relationships, on getting to know you, on building safe space for learning, um, intellectual risk taking and so on, um, on our campus. So when you come to our campus, if you haven't before, um, lots and lots of people really, um, we're a new campus, I think from, I think 13 years, I've been here 13 years and we had just moved from our old location to our new location now. And when I first came to that campus, there was lots of dirt and lots of pieces of sticks um, pretending to look like trees. However, our campus now over 13 years has wonderful foliage and trees and grass and just, you know, it's, it's a great, I think it's a wonderful space. Um, it has a great energy about it and it's only getting better. So, um, so not only is location important, um, our cutting edge PhD research curriculum. So about nine years ago, um, we based um, our thinking as we tried to, we had a fantastic PhD program, but we wanted to modernize, make contemporary, really uh, move to the future in terms of um, what we had to offer. We developed our, our curriculum um, building on the framework from the Carnegie Foundation on uh, the whole science based on what is a PhD across multiple disciplines and then drew from that um, the, the whole notion of the framework of formation of scholars and that informed and underpinned our curriculum development that we did. We also have, um, in addition to well, what is a PhD, you know, you have some coursework, you'll do your dissertation work and then you'll have this big book at the end. Um, but in addition to that, in addition to having a PhD, 
Um, our curriculum is infused with, um, I think, around about eight graduate qualities. So our whole curriculum consists of more than just our courses. It is about these intensive experiences that we provide. It is about peer learning, it is about cohorting. So in this case, around caring science, um, but also cross years, as well as cross focal areas in our program. Um, we really build not only the coursework with different faculty, your cohort, cohorts and your focal areas, but also building that team science, that, that broader village um, that constitutes a PhD um, committee. Um, and those things together, not only informed um, by team science and the new directions that the United States and the sort of research directions are going in, but also uh, particularly with caring science in terms of the amazing work done by um, our emeritus dean, um, Professor Jean Watson um, and her work from the seventies onwards. But of course she was a former dean of ours um, as well as being foundational in terms of the caring science work that has then broadened. So our curriculum is evidence-based, it is experientially based, it is innovatively based. And to my view, I think it's somewhat maverickly based uh, because I think that's what's important in terms of moving ideas, the science and the field forward. So as you know, we have um, three particular focal areas, biobehavioral science, which is very much traditionally what people think of, when they think of a PhD, often lab work or um, biobehavioral measurement, instrumentation and so on. We have uh, healthcare systems, uh, which is incredibly um, innovative here in the United States. We get a lot of people wanting to come to our program. Uh, we're very blessed to have Professor uh, Joyce Verin, um, who passed away last year. Um, who was a great leader in system science and systems research. So we have a nice foundation in that too. So very much around healthcare organizations, uh, healthcare system systems of delivery and so on. And then of course we have our caring science platform. So um, shortly I'll move on to Dr. Johnson. Please know that when people come into our program, they'll often gravitate to one idea. Our first year of the curriculum is really built on um, supporting core understanding and core building blocks related to our PhD curriculum, inquiry, thinking like a, a scientist. And when I say scientist, I'm a qualitative and mixed methods researcher, so I mean scientific inquiry in its broadest sense um, in terms of having approaches and um, expectations and benchmarks, not just traditionally known as the scientific method. Um, but more of that when you come to our program, we'll challenge your thinking, don't you worry. Um, we'll often find that individuals come to our program with a fairly good idea of what they want to do. That's part of our admissions process, um, but it doesn't have to be perfect. And when you participate in the first year, that really is helping to funnel down and focus your idea, not to narrow your interests, but to get you some focus on where you think you might be going. Sometimes our students come in in one focal area and straddle another. It's not uncommon for people in caring science to also have some kind of interest related to healthcare systems um, or similar for biobehavioral science. But there's always opportunity at the end of that first year to reevaluate where you are. But our caring science um, is very broad and very deep all at the same time. <laughs> um, so, you know, we will, our program is designed to work with you where you want to go using our expertise and our wisdom. We do take a, um, a wisdom of crowds approach. We have some fantastic faculty, um, some who are incredibly active in the research field, some are incredibly active um, in the practice arena or policy arena, and then have some overlap and come together. So um, part of our admissions process is through your application, through your conversations with China, through your writing your essays or presenting your ideas, um, it helps us, and hopefully you will have done this too, which is look onto our website, have a look at our faculty, you know, poke around and see who's got similar interests or not, um, you know, look at some of their papers, because one of the strengths of our program really is our matching of faculty to students, and that's all about student success. I won't go on about this, but I will tell you from an evidence-based um, uh, foundation for you, um, PhD success for students is all about relationships. It's all about the way in which you interact with our program, how you interact with our faculty and how our faculty and program interact and support you and your peers. 
So it's very much the strength is if we can get that, that successful relationship, not only with an individual sage per se, but also that village, that team science, those people around you in our curriculum to really support you moving forward. So those things come together and really strengthen the program. I'm not sure what my next slide is and I might just let, um, oh, yep, so here you are, you see lots of people. So to my point about, um, have a look, go on our website if you know of some people. Um, Emily, you know of Dr. Johnson, so look up her publications or um, look up mine or look up other people. Um, you know, reach out to people. We love you to email people and say, hey, you don't know me, but I'm interested in or I see your works here. We really, really want you to reach out, have beginning conversations. That will strengthen your application. Um, and so we have some world leaders, some international leaders um, across a whole variety. Um, and these are just a snapshot of the individuals that we have. And I could spend a whole two hours singing the praises of our fantastic faculty because they genuinely are. They are invested in your success and they're very passionate about their world of research and practice that they're in. Um, and together those things are about really helping people and communities moving them forward. So I think I might, uh, maybe I'll just pause there, I think, China, and I'm gonna um, hand over to Rachel. To Dr. Johnson to share a little bit about her journey, why she chose our program, Why Caring Science, um, and a little bit about um, lessons learned perhaps. Over to you, Rachel. Absolutely. So I am a social worker. I'm a licensed clinical social worker who I originally started off actually working in clinical settings, doing clinical social work. I graduated from the University of Denver here in Colorado from their social work department. And I worked in nursing homes and I worked in community care. I really loved the work that I was doing, but I actually ended up deciding to look for another job, which is the whole other story I can get into at some point if you'd like to hear it. Um, but when I started looking for another position, I actually found a job that said, it was like a LinkedIn and it said um, looking for a psych, like a licensed psychotherapist to help with a randomized control trial. And my first thought was, oh no, I don't want to do research. Like that sounds like the worst thing ever. But it was saying that the psychotherapist could do this structured psychosocial intervention. And I thought, well, that's something I might be able to do. So I actually decided to apply for it, ended up getting the position with the idea that I would just be doing clinical work. But I went from a caseload of 3,000 to a caseload of three, and I was really bored. So I started asking around with all of my colleagues about how I could learn how to do other things to help them out, or if they had things that they needed done, can I do this, can I try that? And so I started learning kind of from the ground up how to do research, and that was about a decade ago. So I started learning how do you recruit people for research studies? How do you manage a research study? Where do you apply things? How do you do this? But then as people started to understand my expertise and the clinical work that I had done, I got to consult on research projects and help design interventions and help design grants and start moving within that structure. That actually is where I got introduced to Dr. Jones. She was one of the consultants that we had on one of our research studies, and she helped train me to do qualitative research back in the day when I was very first learning how to do it as an assistant. And so that relationship I was able to build with her is part of what led me to be aware that the College of Nursing had opened up their PhD to be interdisciplinary. And they had just opened it up the year before I applied. So I actually was the first interdisciplinary student and went into the program knowing, okay, I've got this background in clinical work, I've got this background in research, but I'm not sure about going into a, a field of nurses and what that interdisciplinary experience would be like. I had applied to be able to go to other PhD programs and I interviewed in other PhD departments thinking, I know I wanna develop my own program of research and I know I have questions that I wanna explore. Basically, I'd been on interdisciplinary research teams, where as a team, we explored questions, but it was really led by physicians, which, you know, they had some good questions, but I have good questions too. And so I wanted to know what it would be like to be able to do my own research. And in exploring that and learning more, like how do you advance? How do you get to that place? It really is about getting a PhD in order to open those doors to funding, to support, to be able to explore your own ideas and your own questions. 
And so I actually had questions around how do people create stories about their experience living with heart failure, and particularly veterans. So I had done research in the VA system. That's where I worked for a decade. And so I was really interested in learning more about that idea. When I went to the college here, well, I guess actually, I think they say it's a graduate school, but the social work school here, what I found was the more traditional PhD pathway where it was the idea of like, we accept for students, they have to be the top of their game, they need to have emphasis in these specific areas, and then we're going to have people compete against each other in order to figure out who the cream of the crop is. And that culture was something that put me off. Like I, I felt like maybe that wasn't the direction that I wanted to go in, that I wanted something that was collaborative. I wanted something that was team-based. Like my clinical experience had taught me that when we worked together as a team, we made magic happen. It wasn't me being able to compete and destroy other people to get to the top. It was about me building relationships and connections to be able to rise to the top and to be able to collaborate and, and work with other people in a way that supports everyone. And so I felt like maybe that wasn't the pathway I really wanted to go in, in that type of, um, I guess, more traditional PhD hierarchy. When I came to the College of Nursing, I had a couple of people that I kind of had been exposed to because I did research on the campus and so I knew a little bit about it. But the, the whole atmosphere of how they welcomed me into the PhD program was extremely different. I it was very much about like connecting with me as a person, getting to know who I was, being flexible with me, understanding that I actually worked full time, went to school full time, taught part time and have a... I guess at the time she was like six years, but now she's almost uh, nine. But my daughter had tried to be a mom and a wife and, and, a, and a dog owner and a, and a cat mom and like all the different things trying to balance that. When I went to other programs, sometimes they would say things like, well, we expect you not to work. And they wanted me to quit my job, my job where I was going to get advancement and my job where I was going to have connections with other people in research. Like I didn't want to quit what I was doing. But the College of Nursing seemed to really understand how to balance having work as well as being able to go to school and having my own personal life, which was really important to me. And that flexibility where you can take off that week for the intensives, but then able to be remote for the rest of the semester just made it so much more flexible for me to be able to work into my schedule. I had the clinical experience, the research experience, and the education experience that when I got got my PhD and was able to graduate from the program last year, which was awesome. I really feel like I'm very well prepared to create my own research trajectory, which the College of Nursing actually hired me as part of the faculty in the caring science degree field. And so I teach one of the courses and I'm a consultant with uh, some of our students. I'm on committees. Like it is, I have to tell you guys like about I think it's almost 15 years now, I had a joke that I was telling in a, in a team meeting. There were 12 social workers and we went around and everybody was like, what's the biggest dream you've got? And people were do, saying things like, well, I want to open a bakery in France or I want to like live on the moon, you know, like whatever it was, crazy out there stuff. And it was just like a way of an icebreaker. And I was like, I want to change healthcare. I want to write a manual to change healthcare, and I want to develop a new type of helping people, and I want to get it out there, and I want people to be interested and engaged and excited, and I want to change things. I want to change the way that we do work. And everybody was like, that's great. And I just laughed because I thought that was never going to happen. And look at me now. Like I've been able to be prepared where I'm starting my career. I am starting my research. I've done research around the things that I'm interested in. I'm towards that trajectory where I really am living my dream. So I feel like the College of Nursing gave me that ability and flexibility to be able to live my life and still pursue a PhD, use the working experience that I already had in a way that other programs may not have allowed me to do. But more than that, in so many ways, was about the building of relationships and connections. I have such fantastic relationships with my colleagues, with my co, well, I guess they're not my coworkers, they're my classmates, but I think of them as being like other people that I work with. But 
all my classmates, we still have Facebook messages and we get together. They just texted out a picture of us on our very first day of school. And we're like, oh my gosh, guys, do you remember this? And we have this fantastic relationship to help support each other. And I've been able to make lifelong friends as part of my experience in this program. And, and don't get me wrong, like it's a not all roses. There are definitely time periods that I sat right here at this desk and cried. But there are also were time periods where I was like, you know what, Rachel, it's okay. We're going to pick up the pieces. We're going to make this happen. I know I can do it. And I felt like even when I didn't believe in myself, that my faculty and my support system believed in me. And that's what gave me the strength to be able to do this. I never thought in any period of my life that I was smart enough or together enough or gifted enough to get a PhD and to do this type of work. But it ends up all I needed was people to support and encourage me and to be there as part of my team, which as much as, as you had brought up, Emily, that I, I give you a, a, a hard time to get you to the PhD program, it's part of me trying to pass on that, like, I feel like I was so well supported and connected. I want to give that to other people because there are so many people that could really add to the field that can change healthcare, that can revolutionize the way that we're doing things. But we need to hear from all of you. We need your ideas. We need your innovations. We need your solutions to things. And so being able to be a part of giving voice to that is just the reason I get up in the morning. Is that in my kid? I don't want my, my kid or my husband to think that they don't, like I, I love my family, absolutely. But as far as my work career life goes, this has just been an amazing experience for me. And then as far as caring science and why I got drawn to that specifically and a little bit about my caring science journey, I actually was doing qualitative analytic work as part of that structured psychosocial intervention. And what I realized is that every single participant in that study, we were doing an intervention with a nurse and a social worker. And really what they said is the biggest difference that this program has made for me is that I know I have people who care about me. I know that there are two people that I can always call who will respond to me and who care about me as a person. And so I came back to my team and told who was the previous, I think, assistant dean of the PhD department, Paula, Dr. Paula Meek, um, I told her, I'm really like finding that everybody in the study is saying caring is the only thing that matters. And she was like, really? Have you ever heard of this thing called caring science? You should check out this book. And I read Human Caring I, um, as my very first book that I had gotten that Dr. Watson had read. She said it was a really good introduction. And I, I tell you, I, I read like the first chapter and I started crying. Like it really impacted me. I started realizing that the interpersonal caring moments that she talks about were exactly what had been happening between me and all of the participants that I had worked with in that study. All the seniors that I had seen clinically and were trying to help that really what I had been doing was building these caring relationships, but I didn't know how to articulate it. As a kid, I used to say, I, I wanna be glowy. I want people to like the people that glow to hang out with me. And I want to be a person who glows. And what I found is that a lot of the people who glowed were social workers. So that's part of the reason, not completely, but part of the reason why I decided to be a social worker is that I thought it could nurture that glow within myself. But what I found is that glow is caring science. That glow is the like intentional practice of being able to nurture my caring and what that means. It's understanding the interconnection between me and all of life and living beings. And so being able to live that idea, being able to articulate what it is that I had been feeling my whole life and seen in my clinical practice but didn't understand was a life revolutionary experience for me. Going through the PhD program was not just about learning research methods, but it also was about learning that I'm confident in my own abilities, learning that I have a network of people that I can rely on and who will help me, and then learning basic stuff like um, I actually am more productive in the morning which kind of sucks because I don't like getting up in the morning, but I decided like, well, I'll do it for my PhD. So then I would get up earlier than I needed to so I could get a little bit of my schooling done and then I could move on to do work or I could go into the office or whatever I needed to do. So part of it is just learning yourself and then giving yourself that permission to find what your strengths are and expanding on that. And that's part of my caring science journey. I want to echo what Dr. Jones had said earlier 
about how often our students will have things where they're like, you know, gosh, this question kind of goes carrying science and it also goes to this and it also has this and it's also biobehavioral and it's also like within health systems totally okay. I, I think that so much of the, the flexibility that's nice is that you can choose how to weave things in and you can figure out where you need to hone in on. But I think it's nice to be able to have that background of understanding that caring science was developed here, that this is the home of where this whole idea sprang from and a lot of the work has been done here. And so it really feels wonderful to be able to explore that and add to caring science as a science and being able to generate knowledge to change healthcare, which is what my dream had been that I never thought I could accomplish. So I, I just had an incredible experience in a lot of ways, but that doesn't mean that it's all easy. I've been saving a lot of memes to send to people if they need it, where it's it's stuff about how like getting a PhD is really tough or like, yes, it's always hard when you like feel like you're doing a literature review. I, I saw one the other day that was like, read for 300 hours, write one sentence. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's my life. So like that type of stuff, just understanding, like it, it does take work, but I have to say that the work was really fun. Like I loved learning about caring science and I loved learning about my research topic. So we'd be given assignments of things that we need to accomplish, but it was still about stuff I wanted to learn about. It was still about my ideas and it was still about generating what I wanted to do. So even though it is work, it was actually work I really looked forward to and I enjoyed. When I graduated, I threatened my committee that I they couldn't get rid of me, that I wanted to be a student forever and surely I could just take more classes. It ends up being a teacher means I can be a student forever, so they can't get rid of me. So, And one of the things, and thank you so much, Rachel. Um, Absolutely. One of the things I would say, whatever we're doing, the secret sauce that makes our program successful, and I can say that in an informed way because we've just undergone our five-year higher learning commission um, review, you know, the, are we doing a good job? Um, our, our students, um, we would love to introduce you to people who are in the program. We want you to find out what's and all, what is it really like? You know, how is this program going to work for me? Because we also have students, who, um, you know, who come during our intensives. Their second years come and they talk to the first years. Their third years come and they share their wisdom. Um, we don't just do the SAGE on the stage model here. Our students, our graduates, our alum are, are part of our family, part of that village that I think makes us so great. But also we, um, our students, when they graduate, they don't want to leave us. <laughs> they come back. They want to do work with us. They want to be part of our faculty. And I think that is um, I think that speaks volumes, so don't just take our word from it. Um, I know this session goes until six o'clock, so I'm just wondering, China, do you want to give some practical tips? And then if we've got any more time at the end, uh, we can have some questions. But please know, we do a couple of these. I'll do a fireside chat. You can call and ask us lots of questions. Um, but over to you briefly, China. Perfect. And... I'm so help. I'm, I'm so thankful for the support that we have amongst us all. Um, what you guys see here on the screen is is a little out of date. I I will admit I've been using a Mac for a long time. I switched and got a quick little Surface and tried to open up my presentation today, and I don't have Keynote on this, so didn't get a chance to edit my dates. So I am going to make these changes to these dates that you guys see while we're chatting. So please note the dates um, are incorrect on the screen. Um, but as, as we get started, if you are ready to move forward, and um, Rachel, would you go backwards just one slide for me? Um, oh, yep, to the, that very first one. And maybe that is it. Do you meet the eligibility criteria? Oh, this is the one, yes. So again, I think I've had a conversation with many of you all. Um, and if I haven't, I know Elizabeth is on the call. She and I are playing a little bit of phone tag here. Um, it, it certainly is my um, intention to have this preliminary conversation with you to help flesh out any of these questions. Where, which focal area do, you know, se seems best? What kinds of, um, you know, faculty profiles or bios should I be exploring? Who can you refer me to? And, and really that affirmation that, 
you know, either the PhD or the DMP, um, you know, is the direction that you should move forward in. So that preliminary conversation with me um, is usually how we get started. And it does flush out all of what I'm getting ready to talk about today. So if you haven't had that conversation and you would like to with me, um, you'll find that there's a scheduler button or you can email me and I will certainly reply back with um, how to get on to my calendar so that we can have that um, conversation one-on-one. -on -one. It certainly is really helpful, like I said, specific to questions that you might have about your own background or, you know, things that, that maybe you don't want to widely share, um, at least initially. So if you are ready to begin, um, as I mentioned, we will be opening up our application for our fall 22 cycle. You guys can see how long we've been using some of these slides. I've been around at the College of Nursing for I think it's seven years now, which is crazy. Um, but like, this is a program that I champion so much because it you really can see the return. Um, I when folks are graduating and they are in their tans, and uh, it, it is such a sensational experience. And I've had the opportunity to witness it several times, um, and it certainly is one that even even from my you know preliminary conversations with you guys that I, I can see the progression and it makes me so full. So again, as we open this new application cycle, August 15th, 2021 for a fall, which is a late August, 2022 cycle, I wanna encourage you all not to wait to get started with your materials. Um, so much of what you should be doing right now is exploring your topic. You should be exploring faculty, asking questions, you know, and again, starting to create a checklist for yourself. Um, so, um, Rachel, if you'll, you'll move forward to the next slide, you'll, you'll find that our process really does get started kind of in the springtime with that exploration, but then that whole cycle is open through the fall, so through that August 15th timeframe through the end of the year. So any time during that point, good point to be checking in with us and certainly getting your application materials uploaded and submitted. Um, many of you have already heard this and know that you meet the eligibility criteria, um, but I certainly want to touch on this really quickly. Um, most of the students that start with us are BSN prepared um, and or have a graduate degree in nursing. Um, if not, that's okay. Um, caring science is actually the uh, focal area where we're able to make it more interdisciplinary. Um, and so you guys are hearing from, from Dr. Johnson, who's a social worker, and Emily, who mentioned earlier that she too is a social worker. And I think it just speaks to the fact that this truly is a focal area where we want to be able to gravitate and pull together many different disciplines, you know, and the understanding of what, what are you adding or what, how can we diversify that experience? Um, and I think it truly has been able to add to this particular focal area. So if you have questions about, you know, do you meet that eligibility based on the type of graduate education you have or undergraduate education, please don't um, hesitate to reach out. At minimum, that undergraduate um, cumulative GPA should be at a 3.0 and your graduate education at a 3.5. Um, and then we do ask for um, indication or we typically look at your transcripts. You're going to note some of these things when you're completing your application material, but particularly we ask you to aggregate out two prerequisite courses. Do you have a graduate level nursing theory class? Typically, if you've got a master's of science in nursing, you have a nursing theory class, but we found, you know, and in, for instance, some midwifery degrees that it, it wasn't as prevalent. Um, so we do offer a graduate level nursing theory class that you can take with us or you're certainly wel welcome to explore taking it at other institutions and then just affirming with us that that prerequisite you know has been met the other question i often get is how old do those courses can they be or you know how new do they need to be um, they can they can be as old as when you took them um, so we're really looking at the content and to affirm that again you're meeting these prerequisites with the grade um, but again if you're feeling like you're lacking i want to explore taking in a nursing theory class with us or if you did not take which is often the case for many of our students an intermediate statistics class you can fulfill those with us as well um, you also do not need to have satisfied both prerequisite classes prior to application we had a lot of people that are asking hey do I, does this need to be complete before i apply 
does not have to be. It can be at in progress or something that you plan to take within you know, that, that time frame. The classes should be complete and we should have indication of that completed course via transcript um, with that, or excuse me, in essence, before you get started. So you would see it would be an outstanding prerequisite to complete if we offer you admission. And we'll talk to you about what the process is for satisfying that are. The next slide, if you don't mind. Um, the admissions process, this looks really wordy. It really, really does. There's a nice, again, very concise checklist of items right on our website. What we're hoping for is a complete application with the application fee. Um, that fee has increased as well. It's a $65 application fee for domestic students. So I wanted to point that out. Um, but outside of that, we do want you to submit a scholarly paper with a nursing focus or domain. We get asked that question quite a bit. Um, and we certainly, and I, I see that Dr. Jones is saying that we can extend the time and, and stay on to address other questions. We, we certainly can, I'm, I'm also available. That scholarly paper with that nursing focus um, can come from your graduate education. Um, it can come from a collaboration in an article um, that you, you know, that, that you authored. Um, we really just want to see your writing as it pertains to nursing. Um, so you will upload a, a copy of a, of a paper that you've written um, or an article. There is a submission for a personal statement um, or your essay. Uh, again, we give you a range of words there, um, but what we're really hoping you, you do in this, and it's very detailed for you, is one, talk to us about your focal area. So everyone here is interested in our caring science focal area. Why, fo why this particular focal, focal area for you? What is your topic that you wanna explore? Um, we then wanna know, you know, what faculty have you had a chance to talk to? You know, have you explored this formally with any of our faculty? And so again, part of that initial conversation is us linking you with someone that, someone or some ones um, that you can have that conversation with and, and don't be shy. Um, they are expecting your conversation. They are expecting to hear from you. Um, and, and we've primed the pump with that. I mean, many of our students come from referrals. I mean, I'm not everywhere right now. I used to be, <laughs> I can say that. I used to be out recruiting, um, but you know, the slow of you know, convening in that, in that manner really did kind of take things out of play for us in that regard. And so I think one of the strengths truly of our PhD program is, it, is that we're very collaborative in nature. So whether it is our active students that are continuing to talk about their experiences with others, with their colleagues, with their students, um, while they're out, you know, doing do, doing research, um, certainly networking with others, it's, it's a strong point for us. Um, of course, our faculty are out there often, and so that it takes some of the pressure off of me, which is wonderful. Um, but but at the same time, we want we want everyone to have the same enthusiasm about our program. So from there, you're also going to have, like I said, that opportunity to talk to faculty. Um, and then finally, we want to know about your goals. Um, we want to know what do you want to do with your PhD? How is it that you are either planning to change healthcare um, or that you see getting your question addressed? Do you want to work in academia? Um, so talk to us about some of your goals as it relates to why you're applying to the PhD program. You will provide a copy of your resume or your CV. You'll upload that along with you'll list out three names and email addresses for references. One of these references, if not two, should be from a PhD prepared academic. And so if you haven't yet you know, identified someone who is PhD prepared, certainly something that you wanna be thinking about. That is a key point that our faculty have driven home um, and will certainly do if they are, are interviewing with you. Um, they they wanna know, have you had an opportunity to really flesh this out and, and talk to someone who's been in these shoes before? Do you know what kind of journey this might be? Um, and so again, it's really, it's, it's in your best interest to have these conversations while this, you know, while, while we're getting geared up for the cycle. Um, and then I get questions all the time about transcripts um, and then the GRE. So these are the two things that we certainly can expand upon more if needed, um, but <clears throat> no problem, no problem. Um, you, you certainly want to have official 
have your transcripts sent to nursing cast. Do not send them directly to the institution. Um, so we'll talk about that and that's there, but more than, more than anything, start early. Start early gathering those transcripts if you know that you're gonna be applying. Um, you know, request them directly from the institutions and you'll have a physical address for where those can be mailed or an electronic um, clearinghouse address that can do kind of that, that sending process from institution to institution and take you out as that middle person. Um, so get started early with your official final transcripts. We find that really a lot of our PhD students have a ton of education. You've attended like hmm, four, maybe five institutions. Um, and so again, we need all transcripts. And then finally, um, the GRE. A lot of students ask, is this a requirement? Do I need this? You know, how old is it? What pieces are you really looking at? And the GRE actually is no longer a requirement for our students who are coming in with a graduate degree. So that takes a lot of the pressure off. I have had so many sighs of relief from students that are like, oh my gosh, I can't, can't imagine taking another, you know, standardized test. Um, and really our graduate school had indicated that it truly was not, you know, a, the best indicator of how well you'll do in graduate school. Um, you know, and so if you have completed the GRE and have scores to submit, we would love for you to, to, to submit the scores so that we're able to see them. But it is not a necessity that you complete the GRE or that you make time to do so um, unless you do not have a graduate degree. So if you are entering our program and considering our pathway, which has you, you know, BSN prepared, but moving forward to the PhD you will need that GRE. And you certainly will wanna chat with me about this. And then where do I send things? So this is a mailing address that is physical to our school and, and, and is <clears throat> specific for, hey, if you've got those outstanding prereqs, the application cycle has already closed and you're gonna be finishing up a course in the spring or taking a course in the summer, but that cycle is already closed, that's when you send the transcripts to us. Otherwise, Everything in your application is actually uploaded through that nursing cast application um, or mailed directly to them. So I want to be very, very clear about those things. And then you can see I hadn't even updated um, all of my slides, but Dr. Jones's information is here. So you see the email address for myself and Dr. Jones. I um, I certainly manage or, or I have a bunch of balls that I'm juggling. I think that's the best way to say it. And a couple of different email addresses that I'm checking on the regular. But you can certainly get a hold of me on my personal um, email address there for work directly, or that, that first line there points to our PhD program, the website, and, and specifically an email address that's tied to our PhD program that I also manage. Um, so feel free to reach out to me or Dr. Jones or even Dr. Johnson, as you've got questions about um, the program that maybe we didn't address for you tonight or that you'd like to explore in more detail with us. So now we're happy to kind of open things up for questions. Yeah. Any, um, I, we know that we said till six o'clock, um, don't feel obliged to stay on, but I'm just saying I can, I can stay on. Um, really happy to answer questions. I think Rachel looks like she's She's uh, ready there too. Um, the pandemic has been a joy for us in many ways, a big social disruptor besides health of other individuals. But, um, you know, we've really been able to reach many people and engage very regularly with conversation through, um, if you email me, my signature block has my, tech, my cell phone on there. You can text me. Um, I'm usually very rapid at, at turnaround time. Um, even on the weekend, you know, give or take, I will text back, et cetera. So um, please feel free to reach out to us. Uh, no question is silly. Um, it might be really pragmatic, really concrete, or it might be really philosophical. So let me just open the floor right now and say, um, any other questions? What else do you want to know? And we can plan some other sessions, other, call, other calls, other conversations, but what can we answer now for you tonight? I had a question. This is Elizabeth. Um, Hi, Elizabeth. Hey, how are you? Um, I was wondering when, um, China, when you were talking about the references, so we don't need any letters of recommendation, just references. Is that correct? Good question. And I'm not sure that I was quite as clear as I, as I should have been. Um, you do need letters of recommendation. 
um, three of them to be direct. However, the application is only gonna ask you for your references names and email addresses. We then send the instructions to your references with what to create and upload on your behalf. So yes, they will need um, to write you a letter of reference. And then there's also like a reading sheet or an evaluation sheet that will accompany our instructions to them that we ask them to fill out on your behalf as well. And then the other question I had regarding that is it sounded like you were saying that the people that we talked to about possibly becoming our faculty were our references. Did I understand that incorrectly? Um, no. So, so um, there's sort of a couple of things there, Elizabeth. One is, you know, um, faculty that you've engaged with, maybe colleagues, you know, that have PhDs. Um, we're looking for those kind of people who can comment on um, your ability to think, you know, your interest in research, those kind of things. Um, but simultaneously, we also want you to reach out to our, our PhD faculty um, in terms of working out is this a good fit for you? Do we have the right kind of people? Are there people that could stretch your ideas? Um, not everybody will be absolutely perfect and totally on topic, um, but we have a massive network. So two different ways in which we want you to engage with PhD faculty. One is so that people can, um, sometimes we get applicants from people and the, the people they give, put names forward for a, a letter of support for you, um, you know, are clinicians and they don't know anything about research and they haven't done any and they don't know what your ideas are and your capacity to think and so on. Um, and that does you a disservice. So we really try to encourage, we want a broad um, range of people, but if you don't have people who you know or who you've engaged with who have PhDs, look around, start to have those conversations amongst your colleagues. Um, there's still time, but we certainly look for that. And then do reach out to our faculty to see what kind of fit we might be for you. Okay, thanks. And I was looking at the chat and I just wanted to make sure that we did address your question about the prerequisite class. We do offer both our statistics class and that nursing theory class. Um, a couple of times a year um, to students exclusively online. So you can fulfill those prereqs with us, um, but it's but you don't have to. You certainly can explore other institutions to do so. Send us the course description and we can affirm that, um, you know, it will satisfy the prereq or not. And oh, yeah, I'll email you about it. Oh, no worries. And um, what I'll also say uh, about that prereq, the uh, inferential stats, you know, the intermediate statistics, um, some of our, you know, we designed our course, our inferential stats, the intermediate stats, um, really to make sure that you had the appropriate foundational blocks that help you when you go into the PhD program and we build on those ideas. We don't insist that you do ours if you need to have it though. Um, certainly um, it will help you um, ease into our learning style, our online approaches and also some of the concepts that we have later, but the choice is yours. Other questions? Well, I guess I just want a little bit of clarity um, for those of us that come predominantly from the clinical world. Are, is it important that we have a, a research question already sort of honed in on or? No, so, so Laura, you know, it's really interesting. We have students, we have applicants who come across the whole spectrum, you know, a clinical curiosity or something they've been doing clinically that they've really started to challenge and then see in their populations or what have you, and all the way to those who have really got a very fine-tuned question. We want you to have a broad idea. We want you to have an, an area of what is your area of interest and what might some of the questions in that area be? So just help me as an example, Laura, did you say you were mental health? I'm not sure, I can't remember. Yes. So what's your interest? So I have a... a, a I see, I don't have it shaped yet, <laughs> but I have, I have a lot of interest in, in mental health, but I also have an interest in, um, in some interest, uh, in some, some questions around nonviolent communication, which is not yeah. strict, a mental health practice, yeah. but it's, it's really rooted in good mental health mm -hmm. uh, theory and, um, and how, and some of the connections that come in between and then how the underpinnings of caring science and the caring theory sort of connects all those dots. 
that I don't, I cannot yet boil that down to a, a hypothesis or a, a question. Oh, you don't <laughs> but need to. Where my mind is going. So, so. Let, let me say one of the reasons we ask you to reach out to our faculty, and especially earlier on in the piece, is so that you can, and I think I put in the chat about um, um, Dr. Kerry Peterson. She is a DMP, I think she's a DMP and PhD. She is the lead of our mental health and nurse practitioner programs. So, and Kerry also is on. Um, um, she's on one of my PhD students committees, um, so she's a subject matter expert on that. So she might be an ideal person, at least in the beginning, to email and say, hey, I'm interested in doing a PhD. I participated in this. Can I talk to you about my ideas around mental health? And so having a chat to a number of people in the broad area, um, reading in your area, seeing where kind of the research directions are going, and um, that can be incredibly useful. So that by the time you get to actually putting in your application, having talked to a number of people, um, and we have quite a few people in biobehavioral, Dr. Paul Cook, um, a, a number of people, and I think China might have already given you names, but there are a number of people who are doing tangential work, but, um, but might actually pull together. So talk to different people, talk around what you're interested in. But I think um, the best advice I can give you is, if you're interested in this, I think you said nonviolent communication, I think is what you said, is what is that about? Can you articulate what that is? What does it look like? Do you know, are there any interventions out there called, I don't know, I'm making this up, Laura, um, but what's the cutting edge? You know, go on to the, um, the National Institute for Mental Health, have a look on their website. What, is, what are they saying in terms of nonviolent communication and interventions um, and, and think about, what's my end game here? You know, so for somebody, it might be emotional well-being. For somebody else, it might be utilization. For somebody, else, I don't know. But really thinking about what's my end game? What do I really want to know? What do I want to do with it? And what do I want to improve? And then having those conversations will really help you. We do not expect you to have a hypothesis and, you know, three nice lists of research questions. But it, it will be... Um, you will find the experience more valuable if you can start to think around a topic area exactly as I've said. So what is it about nonviolent communication? When you talk about mental health, where do you want to go with that? You know, is it the level of the person or a system or go ahead, Laura. So, so really what the question is has, has something to do with ways to intervene about or regarding trauma, whether it's clinical, clinical inpatient hospital versus yep even community level interventions, yep. mm -hmm. but it's really about trauma on all those different levels, which mm -hmm. is both clinical and social, and it's a lot of I'm going to put you in touch with Dr. Rachel Johnson as a, um, <laughs> as a supervisory licensed clinical social worker who works with MIREC. I was just thinking, like I do suicide yes, prevention please. and mental health research, and I am very interested in mental health as a, as a licensed mental health therapist. So absolutely yeah. reach out. And there are so many people that have such interesting focus areas and aspects of mental health. One of the things about the college is that it's so good about being holistic. Like it's not like we just focus on physical health or it's not like we just focus on one aspect. So I, I think there'll be a lot of people that you can absolutely reach out and talk to, but I would love to. Okay, well, that's very helpful. So we don't have to have the, the like a research question okay. already developed or, you know. Oh, yeah. Not today. What would be really useful is what are the three building blocks? You know, I'm talking about a very simple, where's the end game? What thing is connected to what do you think? So to your, your point, points of intervention. That's where you're saying, where can we intervene? Where can we make a difference? How can we help? How can we recognize, et cetera? Um, and even that will just get you off thinking about it. Talk to Rachel, do talk to Dr. Uh, Kerry Peterson. And please know that our college, uh, we've had a benefactor um, this last year. We've had a substantial amount of philanthropic donation um, and mental health in its broadest concept. Um, is very, very highly regarded in our college, broadly, as well as within their specialty as well. So yeah, good luck. Thank Thanks for your <laughs> feedback. I appreciate it. No worries. And um, what other questions might we have? Who do we have left some people? Anyone else? Take a chance while we're here. It's pre-cocktail, just saying. <laughs> okay. Well, the two of you guys are left, um, or the you two ladies are left. 
Um, and again, we really appreciate your participation this evening. Um, if we, like I said, if we've missed anything, um, please do not hesitate to reach out to us. We're happy. If, if you feel like you might be um, benefited by joining one of the other sessions, please come join us. Um, Absolutely. As there's a lot of overlap as, as we've talked about. And so it doesn't hurt to hear from another, you know, um, alumna who's, who's been through the program. Um, and, and again, really just make sure you feel comfortable as you move forward um, in our process, should you choose to do so. So thank you again. Thanks everybody. Great to see you. Thanks, Rachel. Yeah. Thanks, China. Thank you. Okay. Bye everyone. Bye. Bye, -bye.